Okay, news. Uh, the Supreme Court did a thing that we didn't expect them to do. Again. Feels so good. Feels so good. It feels good. I feel like I'm constantly bracing myself for the hammer to fall down on Roe v. Wade, which it almost certainly will at some point. But in the meantime, there are cases that they're deciding that are not the worst possible outcome. And it feels no. weird. Aaron, also, do you know what the Supreme Court did for us? They sent decisions down before we recorded. <laughs> they did, yeah. The, the 10 a.m. box time, Eastern time, is, is really helpful for us because we can find out a couple hours in advance sometimes what's going to happen. So we, we say thank you, SCOTUS. Yeah. Um, thank can, you. I, can I talk about my favorite case? Yes. Okay. So, Aaron, in a major student speech case, the Supreme Court has sided with students, ruling that a cheerleader's online profanity about her school is protected speech under the First Amendment. It was an eight to one vote with only fucking Clarence Thomas being his usual douche self. <laughs> eight to one. Eight to one eight in favor. To one. So, I, the case was super, I mean, People love to sensationalize it because it's got like the tic-tac-toe of things you can put in a headline. Cheerleader, Snapchat, profanity. Like she, so there was a cheerleader um, who got upset about cheerleading. And over the weekend, she put up a Snapchat that said, among other things, fuck cheer. So there was no like targeted bullying. You know, she wasn't going after anybody. It was off school property, not during school hours on a platform that was not owned by the school using equipment that was not owned by the school. And she faced disciplinary action as a result of that snap because some narc who saw the snap told the cheer coach, don't be a narc, kids. Come on. Don't be a narc, especially when eight Supreme Court justices disagree with you. Yeah. They ruled this person a baby Karen. Whoever this fellow student was that saw this snap is officially, according to the Constitution, a baby Karen now. Well, and for anyone of school age who is listening to us, also worth knowing that the justices concluded that a few swear words posted online from off campus did not rise to the definition of disruptive. Yeah. Yeah. So there have been some Supreme Court cases that establish that schools can regulate student speech if it's disruptive, if it's bullying. There's a bunch of narrow uh, circumstances under which they can discipline students for off-campus speech. But this isn't one of them, which I think is really good news for a couple of reasons. One, what is being a teenager if not sometimes just being like, fuck cheer on Snapchat, you know? I mean... Well, that's part What's of What's the point? <laughs> it's part of the experience, getting mad and, and lashing out on your own time in a way that doesn't hurt anybody. But, you know, another thing is, I think, looking more broadly, at a time when public schools are being stripped of money left and right, uh, state governments are trying to funnel money into charter schools and religious schools, which are often, you know, run by the church or run by corporations, I think empowering school administrations to discipline students for off-campus behavior is a slippery slope. It's dangerous. And we don't want to go down a path where we eventually have churches and corporations disciplining students for speech off campus. I think this is good. And I think you and I both disagree with the Biden administration on this one. The Biden administration was in favor of the school. Yeah, like why? <laughs> I don't know. I feel like it's also a function of like a lot of people in government are old and don't quite understand how any of this works and are trying to make rules about it from a position of not knowing how any of it works. I know. And, and you know, like my position on that would be if you don't know, maybe just be quiet. <laughs> Uh, when has that ever stopped anybody in government? I feel like the less they know, the louder they are in a lot of cases like this. But we can hope. We can definitely hope. We can encourage. We can encourage. And th that's why like people who are younger and more tech savvy should run for office and prioritize like things that have any kind of understanding of technology. Because it's no wonder sometimes that the Russians are totally kicking our ass when it comes to like <laughs> cyber warfare. <laughs> because it's like, look who's running. We, we have like 
it's like a geritocracy, essentially. <laughs> and like, I think that the the wisdom of people who have been around and seen a lot of things is really important to incorporate into government, but so is an understanding of how current life works. So like a little age diversity would be super helpful in, in making good rules. I agree um, with that. Yeah. Oh, we also had the NCAA ruling come down this this past week. Oh, yeah. And you know what? Good, Good for them. Good. Good. They should be able to make money. Well, players should be allowed to make at least as much money as the schools were making off of their likeness. Yeah. The NCAA case basically made it so that the NCAA can't bar schools from uh, compensating student athletes in educational specific ways. So, you know, student student athletes now get scholarships, they get uh, you know, extra tutoring, they get room they get room and board, you know, but there are other things that student athletes could be getting from schools that the NCAA has barred them from getting that relate to their education. And now that's out the window. I feel like eventually they're going to get paid and good. I agree. You know, and it's like I, I was listening to, uh, I think it was NPR, and heard the factoid that Nick Saban, the coach in Alabama, makes $8 million a year. Mm-hmm. It seems like the people who are playing should at least be able to be like, hey, that T-shirt has my name on it. Can I get some residuals? Yeah. It's really crazy. And the NCAA, I like the arguments the NCAA made in their own favor – were like so nonsensical. Like when you actually see it spelled out, you know, it's it's just like, oh, you guys really are, you've completely drank your own Kool-Aid. Like you are high on your own supply. You have no <laughs> idea how silly your reasoning sounds. Like there is no justification for making that much money off people that cannot profit from their own fucking image being used. So yeah. And you know, as much as I hate to admit it, Kavanaugh has been on the right side of the NCAA thing. In the NCAA arguments, he was like the person who seemed to get it the most, um, which yeah. was good. And in the Snapchat case, he seems to have kind of an understanding, um, which is which is better than nothing. That is the standard. Agree, agree. You know, it's good. Good. We're glad. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I mean, look, do I like him? No. No. Will I ever? Probably no. not. <laughs> Can I acknowledge that he did did a thing that wasn't bad? Yes. yes. There we go. That's what makes us such such compelling hosts. <laughs> <laughs> We're so mature. We're so mature We're and new. So ones. mature. We <laughs> can both sides it. No, we can't. I'm just kidding. We sell shirts that say fuck that guy. We are so mature. But you know what? Our <laughs> schools can't discipline us for saying it on Snapchat now. So thank you, Supreme Court. The mildest of thank yous to the Supreme Court. Um, Another thing that happened this week, the Biden administration announced this week that their goal of having at least 70% of American adults partially vaccinated by July 4th is not something that they're going to be able to meet. However, they did point out some wins that they've had, which is that people over 30 will meet that by the Mm -hmm. 4th of July. Mm -hmm. Um, So Alyssa... Here's a thing that kind of confused me. In all of this coverage of vaccines, a lot of it has been devoted to people who are vaccine hesitant who are not under 30, who are, you know, old, angry white dudes in red states. And but the statistics are showing us that the people that are not getting vaccinated are the people that are under 30. So, like, what what gives? I don't know. I mean, look, it's like I think that at least enough older people have been bullied by the idea that they can't see their grandkids unless they're vaccinated. So I think we really have to ask the under 30 crowd, like, what the fuck? You Mm -hmm. should know better. This is not uh, this is not hard. Like, Aaron, I had an example up here where uh, two of my dis- my trees got diseased. And I was very confused because I'm like, I thought these were resistant to cedar apple rust. And they were like, yes, resistant means it won't die. Doesn't mean it won't get it. And so I guess vaccines are kind of like that, right? It's like, we don't want to die. Like, why do they want to die? Get the fucking vaccine. Just mm-hmm. go get the jab. Guess what? Look how many people have gotten it. And everyone's doing pretty okay. So can you please 
Go get it. Like you're you're gathering in groups. You're doing what you want to do. You are DJing your own adventure, but you're also potentially mm-hmm. asymptomatic carriers. So, Erin, what? <laughs> yeah. It also like the thing about the the under 30 stat. First of all, I think there's more people under 30 than there are angry, impotent white men in red states, you know? Correct. Like so that might be skewing the numbers a little bit. Um just that's just how the population kind of lines up. <laughs> but uh here's the thing I wish that they were talking about more and we've talked about this on the show, but we don't know the long-term effects of having covid, even a yes. mild case. We don't know. We're seeing really weird long-term effects on people who have serious cases, like lingering effects of COVID. We're seeing people who are otherwise young and healthy having trouble breathing for months and months and months because of COVID. And, you know, there we don't know everything there is to know about it yet. So I think young people choosing not to get vaccinated um, really are, it's demonstrating a failure of communication that we haven't communicated. Like, look, most of the people who have died from COVID are in more vulnerable populations than you, but we don't know. If you get it, do you want to have long COVID for 40 years? Like, do you want to have fuzzy brain? Do you want to face erectile dysfunction, which is a thing that has been associated with getting COVID? Do you want to face uh, any number of vascular issues that haven't been fully studied yet? Um, do you want to pass it on to somebody who's possibly immunocompromised, who who the shot doesn't work on? Do you want to have that on your conscience? And I don't know, maybe we just need more pro-vaccination content on TikTok. Maybe, but also it's like, you know, this is something that has had me particularly riled for the last 16 months. But like the more the disease spreads, which is what you are doing and participating in if you haven't been vaccinated, the more it will mutate. And now the predominant strain in America is the Delta strain, which is proved to be more virulent. And like, I don't know what comes, does Epsilon come after Delta? (laughs) Right? I think I think Epsilon. So. I don't okay, know. I don't want to see the Epsilon strain. So I don't want to see what it's going to be capable of. I just think that we are so close. And I just, you know, how fucking hard is it? It's free for God's sake. Yeah. I mean, that that's another thing. It is free in terms of cost. But right. it's not free Good in point. terms of it's not free in terms of time. Right. So if like somebody has to deal with like a boss that's giving them shit about taking time off to possibly, you know, spend a day feeling a little under the weather after getting their second dose. Like, I can understand why a person wouldn't want to do that. But I do think that, like, you know, it's on employers to make it appealing to mandatory to get the vaccine. Because, you know, there have been some recent court cases that have shown that, yeah, you pretty much can require your employees to get it. A bunch of people in a hospital in Texas learned that the hard way by getting fired. I think another thing that that should and can happen is I think colleges, all colleges should require, you got to require it. Guess what? When I showed up at the University of Vermont and hadn't had my like second measles vaccination or my booster, they fucking hunted my ass down at the old Chittenden dorms. And they were like, you'll be going to get your vaccination today. And I did. And I'm here and I'm fine. (laughs) Right. I mean, I, I feel like this is another thing that so many people have gotten it without major incident and so few people have gotten COVID without it being something that is concerning to like seriously life fucking. It just, just assess the risk here. You know, like if you get COVID, the ch- the chances of you having something very bad happen to you are high or the chances of you enabling something very bad to happen to somebody else, high. If you get the vaccine, the chances of that happening, quite low. So... Yeah, quite low. Like, let's let's be a little bit smarter about assessing risk. I know that kids, people younger than what, like 25, they don't have a fully developed frontal lobe. Or frontal lobe. <laughs> what is it? it? It's like, well, whatever. I'm just saying, like, make decisions in a way that, that accurately assesses the risk. Like, instead of applying different standards to the vaccine than to the disease, understand that you are encountering both of those things in the same world. So do the thing that is less risky, which is getting the vaccine. That's that's all I have to say about that. When we come back, Alyssa has to jump off, but I am going to have a chat with yet another Hysteria three-timer. Wisconsin is a land of contrasts. Cheese and beer, but also heartburn and hangovers. 
Robert LaFollette and Mark Ruffalo, but also Paul Ryan and Ed Gein. The Milwaukee Bucks, but also the Milwaukee Brewers, although they're in second place, which, wow, okay, baseball. And two senators that could not embody that contrast more strongly. Today, we're excited to welcome back to Hysteria, Wisconsin's good senator. <laughs> she was the Badger State's first woman to serve in the U.S. Senate and the first openly LGBTQ member elected to the Senate. She's our favorite Baldwin. Sorry, Hilaria. Welcome, Senator Tammy Baldwin. I'm so delighted to join you. Thanks for having me. Thank you again for joining the the three-peat hysteria club. I think you're one of an elite group of Ooh. people. Yeah, who've been on here for have been on here three times. Um, so we're about to wrap up another Pride Month. And while this country has accomplished a lot in the way of LGBTQ rights, there's still some important legislation that's not law yet. So can you explain to our listeners why is the Equality Act so important for LGBTQ rights? What does the bill do? And what are the chances that it will pass with this Senate? The Equality Act is uh, uh, designed to be comprehensive anti-discrimination uh, uh, reforms that would protect people uh, from discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. And the reason it's so vital is that in a majority of jurisdictions around the country, um, this type of discrimination isn't outlawed. Uh, or uh, if there are some measures, they may uh, include uh, gay and lesbian people, but not transgender people. Um, there's uh, so many jurisdictions in the country where you can be denied housing or uh, equality in educational settings or uh, uh, bounced from a jury uh, or denied credit. Uh, and uh, but just by virtue of who you are or who you love. Mm -hmm. And so the Equality Act addresses that. Now, there's one major change that happened between last session and this session. Um, and that is that the Supreme Court took up a case uh, last summer that determined that Title VII of the Civil Rights Act protects people uh, on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity in employment discrimination. And what they, the, the way they got there was say, you know, that Title VII outlaws discrimination based on sex and that um, sexual orientation and gender identity um, are uh, inextricably linked to sex and therefore included in the um, Title VII's protections but it's only in the employment setting. So while we have that really important Supreme Court uh, ruling, it doesn't protect people for housing, for education, for public accommodations, um, and these other areas that are very important to our lives. So that's one reason why we have to pass it. I, I'd say one more, and that is that we're seeing a spate of uh, anti-LGBT uh, laws passing in states and being offered in states, particularly focused on transgender uh, individuals and particularly, sadly, cruelly on transgender youth. Mm -hmm. And so um, the Equality Act would uh, bring a halt to these type of anti-gay measures that we're seeing uh, all around the country. Um, so it, it's, it's critical that we pass it. Now, that said, the other part of your question is, is that possible? Mm -hmm. um, so right now, in order to pass legislation uh, in the Senate, we typically need 60 votes. And right now, this uh, measure doesn't have uh, 60 votes. And so we are working very hard. We've targeted about uh, 12 Republicans um, who may want to get to yes in terms of the Equality Act. And we are working very hard, negotiating very hard to try uh, to win them over. Um, and that does involve, you know, discussing maybe some minor modifications that won't do harm to the underlying uh, uh, mission of the Equality Act. Um, but under current rules, uh, we still have a, 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 a lot of... Um, a lot of work to do. Um, 
and and we can get into the idea of filibuster reform in a moment, but I would just say that um, I, that's something that I think the Senate is going to have to look at um, if we're going to uh, move forward on many civil rights issues and voting rights issues, et cetera. Um, but we're not quite there yet. Yeah, we'll definitely get to the filibuster reform and fixing the Senate and all that. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to t- ask you about another important piece of legislation, which is the Biden administration's infrastructure bill. Yes. Um, I think because the media is centered in urban areas, uh, we tend to hear about bills in terms of how they benefit people who live in the cities and suburbs. So as someone who represents a lot of rural people, how do you pitch the infrastructure bill to rural voters? Like, what's in it for them? What does what about the bill should our listeners who live in rural areas, either in Wisconsin or outside of Wisconsin, what should they know about the bill and how it benefits them? Well, I'm just going to start with uh, some very basic facts, and that is if, if you live in a rural area um, that's usually defined as, you know, sparsely populated, it means you need to drive, right? <laughs> you need to drive to get to work. You need to drive to get the kiddies to school. You need to uh, drive to go to the grocery store. And I think the failure to adequately maintain our surface transportation infrastructure is um, much worse for rural America than it is uh, for urban America. And and not to say that I haven't seen horrible uh, uh, infrastructure issues affecting urban America, but I just think, you know, the bottom line is that it's compounded in rural areas where um, travel over the roads is a necessity in order to um, get the things you need um, and get to the things and places that you need to be. And so I, I think that this would have an outsized impact um, on, on rural uh, Wisconsin. Secondly, I'm going to just recount a, an experience that was quite eye-opening for me. And that was early on in my Senate career, we had uh, a, a, an extreme weather event in Northern Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. 14 inches of rain in about, well, less than 24 hours. And, you know, little creeks turned into walls of water and destroyed and washed out roads. Um, and I went to inspect the damage and um, sort of try to uh, assist in federal resources to help rebuild and encountered the problem that a lot of the rebuilding, um, you don't get, you, you just restore what was damaged. You don't get to improve the instru- infrastructure and make it more resilient and stronger. Well, it turns out two years later, another extreme weather event, rain event, um, the, it was basically two 500 year events within mm-hmm. two years. Mm-hmm. And many of the same stretches of road were damaged uh, again, or repair work that was underway for the 2016 storm um, was wiped out by the 2018 uh, event. And I I mentioned that because again, if if this infrastructure plan plans to build back better, uh, more resiliently, stronger, and that will also have an outsized impact on rural America. Broadband deployment is part of this and disproportionately it's rural communities in Wisconsin that lack access to high speed broadband adequate to their needs. I'm so sad every time I hear a story about, you know, the school year habits of families to load the kids in the van drive to the parking lot outside the school so all of them can get the Wi-Fi from the school to do their homework because mm-hmm. homework increasingly, unlike my days, is on iPads. And, uh, you know, so I, I think that this infrastructure plan will have um, an enormous uh, positive impact for rural Wisconsin and rural America. 
Okay, so speaking of the Senate passing things, uh, we are coming off a discouraging few weeks of uh, inaction and obstruction and what my grandpa would have characterized as hemming and hawing uh, about procedure and rules that, that aren't really important to the daily lives of most Americans beyond the fact that they're preventing the Senate from doing stuff that will help people. So right now, the Senate's split 50-50. Democratic senators represent 20 million more voters than Republican senators do. For many voters, it looks like the Senate is broken. So is it broken? Can it be fixed? And what needs to happen in order for it to work for Americans again? Right. Well, yeah, let's just retrace what's happened in the last few weeks. We bought, brought a bill that passed the House um, up in the Senate that would create a bipartisan commission to investigate what happened when we saw on January 6th, a violent insurrection against, uh, you know, on the Capitol and against lawmakers who are counting the electoral votes. That did not move forward because of a Republican filibuster. The next week we had a vote scheduled for the Paycheck Fairness Act, which is about um, helping us move further to eliminate wage disparities between men and women, that was blocked because the Republicans decided to filibuster it. This week, we saw the For the People Act not even be able to move forward for debate, let alone a vote on final passage, um, because the Republicans decided to filibuster it. So I think that um, the way in which the current minority party uh, in the Senate is choosing to use the filibuster is blocking progress for the American people. I was sent to uh, Washington to represent the people of the state of Wisconsin and get things done. And I believe that if getting things done uh, that benefit my constituents um, requires eliminating or reforming the filibuster, that we need to do that. Um, and, and increasingly the pressure is mounting to do something about their, uh, about their obstruction. Well, I am rooting for the filibuster to also go the way of the dinosaurs. Uh, okay, so I don't wanna take up too much more of your time, so I'm gonna end on a light note. Last week, Vice President Harris invited all the women in the U.S. Senate, Democrats and Republicans, to our house for dinner. So is having a group dinner politically productive? Like what could, what types of conversations are you having with like Senator Marsha Blackburn or Joni Ernst? And which senator is surprisingly the most fun dinner guest? Oh, great questions. Well, let me just add that the tradition of the women getting together for dinner um, it's one that Barbara Mikulski started years ago um, when there was like a, a, a sufficient number of women in the Senate to have a, a dinner. Um, and that's been going on since, um, you know, since Barbara Mikulski started it. And she always makes sure that it happens. And she even checks back on us. Are you still meeting? Well, we, <laughs> um, so the last time we had dinner pre-pandemic, um, Senator Harris was Senator Harris, not Vice President Harris. And uh, the, uh, she was part of, of our dinners. And so this was the first dinner we've had as all of us are now vaccinated, et cetera. And it was so wonderful. It's like a big reunion, but of course she's now Vice President hosting us at the Vice President's residence. It was fun. And I mm -hmm. think that while some of our previous dinners have had a lot of policy discussions. This was like a reunion and it was mm -hmm. just fun to be together uh, and catch up. Um, so in terms of uh, uh, your question about who is most fun, well, I was sitting next to Shelley Moore Capito. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, Shelley and I served in the house together and then um, both uh, ultimately now serving in the Senate, she's hysterical. Uh, really, you know, just as a as a dinner companion. 
It was a big enough table now because there's so many of us. Well, we're still just a quarter of the Senate, but, but it is a big enough table that there are all sorts of small conversations going on, interrupted by occasional toasts where somebody would rise and, um, and, and speak to the whole group. Uh, but it was, it was so much fun. That sounds great. And also, I cannot, you know, not to disparage the men in the Senate, because I wouldn't encourage you to do that, but I will. I can't see them doing that. Like, should we? Should women be in charge of more stuff? <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> we should absolutely be in, in charge of more stuff. We One of the things that always comes up at these women's uh, dinners is like, if we were in charge, uh, we wouldn't have X happen or Y happen. We, you know, we would run it better. We would have better policy outcomes. Um, and, and I think that's true. I tend to agree. Uh, Senator Tammy Baldwin, thank you so much for joining us. This was a great conversation and come back again sometime. Also go Bucks. Yes, go Bucks. So exciting. <laughs>